time around we're going to be talking about The Exorcist 3 or The Exorcist's Legion which is written and directed by William Peter Blatty. It's his adaptation of his own novel sequel to The Exorcist. Um, it was released in 1990. I feel I've kind of forced this film on you and you've... Well, taken... yeah, the film after you forced the book on me. So I've finished the novel and then I watched all three Exorcist movies back to back, not in one day, in over consecutive nights. Um, so I feel like I've really been inside William <laughs> Peter Blatty. <laughs> I um, saw it when it came out, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, I was already a fan of the book. Um, I remember when the novel came out, because my family uh, got it from the library in hardback, and it was around the house for a bit, and then it went back, and then I think I must have seen The Exorcist shortly afterwards, way too young. And then I was kind of curious about it in in 89, I think. I went and got the same copy from the same library at the end of the road. Oh, OK. Um, and read it then and loved it. And then just just by fluke, it was it was coming out as a feature film the following year. Um, in those days, there was there was no Internet unless you bought magazines, film magazines regularly. You just didn't know. Mm, true. So I remember popping into Liverpool. And looking at the magazines in, in a shop, waiting for the train back, and there's, oh, The Exorcist 3, oh, it's, a, it's an adaptation of that. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. right, uh, oh, look forward to that. And I saw it that summer with my mum. <laughs> All right, nice. <laughs> she really likes it too. And so that would have been the theatrical cut, the one that um, has the exorcism at the end. Yes. And features Jason Miller reprising the yeah. shell of Karras. Yeah, Patient X, the reanimated mm. body of Damien Karras. In the book he's called Sunshine, ah. which, which doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't uh, resonate quite quite so uh, threateningly. Yeah, this, this, this is a movie that had a very, very famously troubled production, um, not as troubled as The Exorcist 2. The novel is, uh, it's, it's one of my favourite novels. Um, it's a very odd book though, um, and dramatically it it wouldn't translate particularly well. No, not at all. I mean, it's basically a, a theological... Detective story, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, not even that. You know, there's characters in the book who are missing from the film, which, you know, is pretty standard, but one of them is on a really kind of significant journey to try and understand... The... Is that Dr. Amfortas? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, the, and the afterlife and this idea of a, if not a spirit world, because Kinderman is Jewish, so he doesn't believe in an afterlife but they believe in spirits trapped between here and mm -hmm. oblivion or something don't they so you know i think everybody's kind of having these conversations about what it means to leave your body and move or be trapped in fact in the kind of limbo space between here and what comes next and a lot of those elements obviously have to be stripped away i mean you mentioned the amfortas chapter it's it's a yeah you know he, he that that character is a, a surgeon whose uh, girlfriend had died of leukemia. His, yeah, his young wife had died yeah, recently. He, he's just unable to process that trauma. But he himself has, has a brain tumour, which he's refusing That's to right. treat. Yeah, yeah. But he's also tuning his radio into the afterlife, isn't he? So That's one of my favourite... Within the book, it kind of functions... Because the character of Amfortas writes a letter to Father Dyer, one of the lead characters. That's right. And that letter is kind of like a, a short story within the book. Yeah, yeah. But which... it's he's he's leaving him a load of instructions, isn't he? He's like, okay, go here, pick up this reel to reel reel, fast forward it to time code this, <laughs> play it, replay it like twenty five times. And uh, Dan, Father Dyer must have just been like, yeah, I'll probably let that go. <laughs> but it's a terrifying short story in itself. I mean, it's it's the story of how Amfortas is using tape recorders and using them recording in silent rooms and asking questions of theoretically the spirits around mm -hmm. and actually receiving recorded messages on the tapes. Yeah, but not everyone can hear them either, and that's about your open mindedness. Mm -hmm. For me, it's it's just well, yeah. You know, I'll sometimes pick up the novel and just read that short story oh, okay. as, a, as, a, as a terrifying story at bedtime, <laughs> yeah, sure. a chiller, bedtime chiller. So a lot of the characters and themes and semi-abstract themes are just kind of stripped out of the screenplay. Yeah, I think, and I think it it kind of struggles for that. And I mean, having watched like the longer version, or no, it's not longer. The um the director's cut you know maybe it's something to do with him adapting his own work but i feel like a lot of the points that he takes the time to really establish and question in the novel are 
bullet pointed in the film in you know quite abrupt scenes mm. and it very much feels like the film is just a companion piece to to the novel to the novel yeah, yeah. the other thing that i missed that was stripped out was was kinderman's theory of of the universe yeah that's right yeah it's, spiritual it's, a, it's a nice one yeah it sort mm. of holds together if you're looking for that kind of uh, religious explanation for existence yeah <laughs> And there's that there's that breathtaking dream sequence. It's, it's funny. One of the dream sequences from the novel is translated into the film, and it's terrific. But there's a second one which is more cosmic and is based on kind of Kinderman's theory of the universe and God and and the devil, which I thought was absolutely breathtaking on the page. I would have loved to have seen that, but but that whole kind of theological aspect of it is just, is just gone. It's yeah, just written out of the I mean, script. there's bits of it there, and then the stuff that's kind of retained is the the stuff with the Gemini killer and you know it's a it is a really good Brad Dourif performance you know he's great and mm. a, a roller coaster to watch but it, some of it just feels like nonsense and some of it is like padding and then the rest of it's exposition because you know you have a serial killer at the heart of the story that isn't doing anything he's just sat there talking about himself well let's talk about that later because I, I found something Quite interesting in that, watching it the other day, again for this. Uh, should we backtrack slightly and, and talk about the production? You know, for me, I've kind of had to go back and re-watch The Exorcist, and then I didn't want to jump into The Exorcist 3 without watching The Exorcist 2. It felt like, uh, you know, I'd be doing the legacy uh, disservice or something. Although after watching these three, I'm definitely not going to be watching the, the double prequel that was made the oh, I only watched, Schrader Rennie Harlan watched the Schrader one when it came out and it was as dull as ditch water oh yeah okay it's pointless and you haven't seen the Rennie Harlan one I don't <laughs> <laughs> you're not a big Rennie Harlan fan uh, not not terribly no mm-hmm. um, I don't really think he's suited to the material can I put it that way oh yeah okay I like the, the long kiss goodnight oh yeah oh that's brilliant yeah. but that's more his theme yeah, yeah. I would think and have you watched the TV show I watched one episode of it and it was dull. I've heard that it went in an interesting direction and it's supposed to be quite good. But the episode I watched didn't really make me want to watch anymore. Yeah, so I think after sitting through those three, I don't think I'll be looking at any more Exorcist stuff. Yeah. I think I've never been a huge fan of the original. I can see why it gets a lot of praise, but... Um... Yeah, because you mentioned when we were talking about doing this, you said you'd rewatched it and you had some some problems with it. Yeah, I'm interesting because well, I I absolutely adore it. Well, for me, and then it comes back to Blatty. Really, you know, he's um, a strict Roman Catholic. He even um, reported Georgetown University to the Pope for not following canon law. Um, but <laughs> he's he's a hypocrite as well because he's been married four times. I don't want to say like some misogyny there because who knows what each of these relationships was like. But then when you look at The Exorcist, it's a film about a woman who's divorced, uh, who's put her career ahead of her family, whose husband isn't in the picture, and the only communication we see with the husband is this rant. She's yeah. ranting on the telephone. Yeah. And so straight away we would be like, oh, why, why would he want to come home if that's what he's going to come home to? The only thing we see of him is the kind of shrine around the house, a couple of shrines around the house that Regan's put together. Mm. And so for me, the film seems to be saying that a woman who puts her career ahead of her family will be punished by God. That's a very extreme take on it. I, I It just know. feels like it's really obvious, you know, all the way through he's just, he's punishing her. That She's the character that's really punished because... Regan is possessed it's not like mm, and then she's, she, she's she walks out puppet, of it yeah. and even at the end where uh, the exorcism is done and they're leaving uh, Georgetown to go back to New York we see Chris the, the mother come out yeah. and she's kind of quite frosty with the priest as if she's still like refusing to accept that this was a, a religious event mm. but we see Regan come up and she's never met this priest before but kisses him on the cheek as if to say I'll, I'll come back to the fold you know uh, I, I find that really uncomfortable Oh, that's interesting. I've I've never read it in in that light at all. I I kind of like Chris McNeil, and I've never thought that she was. I n- I don't think that she was putting her career ahead of family because she's, the, she and Regan's relationship is is very loving and sure, but and sweet and. But we're looking at it from a modern point of view, mm. um, and I think in the early nineteen seventies, 
a woman who's out of the home all day. There's no husband around and leaves the child in the care of uh, a nanny and an alcoholic film director. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's would be seen as irresponsible in the eyes of the Catholic Church, probably even still now. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I hadn't looked at it that way. And then it just feels like this, this the wrath of God yeah. falls down upon that family because of her decision. Yeah, I think you're probably right about Blatty. I mean, I, I, I enjoy his work, but you don't succeed in Hollywood by being a devout Roman Catholic and following those moral codes mm-hmm. and... I, I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he necessarily has practiced what he preaches throughout his life. Yeah, that's it. And it just seems like he preaches so hard in The Exorcist. And mm. the, just this idea, when I was doing the research, this idea that he reported his university to the Pope <laughs> because they'd had people there. That is this when he were, was studying? No, this was it, like five or ten years before he died because they'd had um, lecturers there that were gay mm. or uh, who talked about abortion and those kind of things. And, yeah. I didn't know that. So, the, yeah, the, the first film I was quite uncomfortable with. I guess, you know, it might just be my reading, but that's that's how it came across. And, you know, the shocks, I think, once you've seen it once, they're not so shocking, and it does feel a bit gratuitous. I really like Jason Miller. I really like Max von Sydow, mm. Linda Blair. I think, that, in fact, the, the whole cast are fantastic. I like pretty much everything about it. I don't obsess about it to say, like, Mark Commode levels. Oh, yeah, okay. But I, I do... It's one of those films that's kind of in the cultural landscape and you take it for granted. Well, and it was such so notorious, wasn't it? Because it was banned, it was on the blacklist. But I, I grew know, up with that being... nasty. Grew up with that being the background to it. So it's just something that you had to see and you watch and yeah, go, oh, yeah. that, that was good, and then move on because it's just ever-present. But then the more I've watched it, the more I've absolutely admired every facet of the filmmaking in it mm-hmm. and you watch it again you watch it for the cutting and you watch you know i don't like william friedkin very much i think he's very hit and miss and i'm only talking about for me there's only like two and a half hits in his career oh yeah okay hit and miss director but with this it's just this kind of feverish desire to make every scene and every aspect of the film as interesting as possible you know, there's, yeah. there's basic stuff like you know, a basic scene where, where Kinderman meets Karis and they're just walking along. Hmm. And he, he manages to make a single shot of them doing that fascinating with a kind of contra-zoom effect on it as they're approaching the, um, yeah. the I, I mean, for building. Me, for me, uh, looking at it again, I found some of that stuff a little bit distracting. Yeah. Like, you know, it doesn't have that uh, flow of pictures. The montage isn't elegant. It can be quite jumpy. And... But it's, it's supposed to be, though. It's supposed to be jarring and jumpy and... and... Yeah, but not... Not in a uh, an effect. Not that it affects the subconscious to draw you into a, you know a disorientating headspace watching the film. I just found like shots didn't cut together. Mm. Mm. Writes in notebook. Shane doesn't like Exorcist. Cross. Shane hates editors. <laughs> okay. Um. So you'll have to tell me about the Exorcist too because I. Well, well, I'm not having a bar of it. Um. I've never seen it. Yeah, I mean, I think it was trying to improve on the first one, I think, because another thing with the first one is this demon Pazuzu, you know, who's like a Mesopotamian ancient king of the winds or something, and he brings the drought, and he brings... Uh... Well, this is all this is all backstory that's added in, in the second film. No, 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 I mean, actual Pazuzu, the, the original... Yeah, but none of this is relevant to the first film. He's just well, a, it is, a demon. Well, it is, because, yeah, he's the demon, so what's... But he's, I don't think he's actually ever named as such so, in the first yeah. film. No, he's not. not. Certainly not in the film. I mean, I know there's kind of like a little icon of him dug up in, in Iraq. And well, no, there's he's... a huge statue that you see uh, Max von Sydow facing down... No, sure, sure, but, 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 but his his... This sort of demon's background is never pertinent at all to the story. It's just simply a demon. But, but then I think when you're talking about demon possession, shouldn't it be? I mean, a, a demon possessing a human form must have an agenda. It's not just like they're there to mess around and cause havoc. Well, that's the thing about the first about the first film. It's always left ambiguous. Is this the devil or is it a devil? Um, it's all. It's you yeah, know. But what does he want? What's the point of? It's even, the devil, it's evil, it wants to, to cause chaos and disrupt and corrupt, is the word, I think. Yeah, but it, it doesn't really, it just affects, in fact, you know, in the end, it doesn't really affect anyone apart from uh, the alcoholic English film director, and then Father Karras. 
That's it. That's the only two people that, you know. So if it's the well, devil, I mean, it, it, you know, they they die. I mean, that's fairly that's fairly extreme. But you've also got you know he's corrupting an innocent young girl. Um, it creates massive aftershocks for the life of everyone involved. I'm, I'm sure Chris and I know, Regan but and I think if you're the devil, that's a, pr- a pretty low, low yield, low, re- low return <laughs> of quite a big investment. And if you're just a demon, what do you want? Because just sitting there in a little you know, or in another person's body. But you don't. But you don't have to have like a, a a James Bond villain plan. You just. You're just. Your your business is causing corruption and mischief and and evil. You don't have to have. But then a goal. That's the thing. That's that's what organized. But then, like Pazuzu, the original god, brings drought and famine. You know, that's now that's a kind of devilish thing to to bring on to a, a population. Whereas just you know, being sick, I just uh, well I've, being being sick and near death and, and twisting your head around, you know, and not taking your binds off because it would be too easy. I don't know. I just, uh, I just didn't buy it as a d- demonic possession. It just seemed the demon had no point. You know, it was all about the other characters, and I think, I think a demon <laughs> going to that kind of effort is going to have a purpose. Okay. Well, back to the Exorcist two. So which... the Exorcist two, just quickly, the um, people involved: John Borman, Ennio Morricone, uh, James Earl Jones, Max von Sydow, Ned Beatty, Linda Blair. You have uh, Louise Fletcher. Louise Fletcher. That's it. That's one I was trying to remember her name. A lot of talented people. And yet, <laughs> and it's a pretty, uh, pretty hokey movie. Some nice visual effects. You know, some. You can feel like the ambition of it. I read somewhere that Scorsese really likes it because it talks about if you are inherently good, do you invite evil upon yourself by the very nature of your goodness? Which uh, what they're suggesting is that um, Regan has some uh, gift from God for healing the sick, and that's why the devil comes after her. It all sounds very much like the kind of bad world building that you get in bad sequels. It reminds yeah, me. Yeah. It reminds me of like you know the direction that all movies go in when they become franchises, like mm. you know when Alien turns into Aliens, and suddenly you get well now they're all called Xenomorphs, and they have mm. this backstory and. And the next film should cover this. Yeah, yeah. And the next film should cover this. It's got a hint of the midi chlorians about it, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And it and it all becomes very bloated, mm. based on a simple kind of effective scary. Yeah, movie. I mean, it does get super confusing, but worse than that, it just gets boring mm. as well. Saving Grace is beautiful pictures and some really nice mid seventies furniture in the mm. background of all the shots. So <laughs> you'll be bored to death watching a scene, but admiring the the lamp or <laughs> something like that or the tiling you know it, it definitely has uh, that kind of style to it so mm. you put it on mute and uh, do some screen grabs for ebay but yeah so by the time i got to three i was pretty uh pretty pretty drained yeah pretty exercised oh, it's funny that you should describe the exorcist too as being kind of so wild and erratic and and different in tone because um i've always thought of well, I mean, like The Exorcist and The Ninth Configuration, Blatty's other movie, and Legion. Yeah. Well, actually, not... the, the Exorcist, I've always thought, is, is a, a kind of gussied up, very, very comforting, old-fashioned film. The world it depicts is kind of, it's still very old-fashioned. There is a god and there is a devil. No matter how shocking the scenes are and how modern the filmmaking is. Yeah, sure. It's basically, you know, it's it's kind of pre-Lovecraft horror. Mm. It's pre, pre-science pre horror, where yeah, yeah. I think I think Blatty's original... Um, seed of inspiration for it was you know if there's a if there's a devil then that would prove that there's the existence of god uh you know if there's demons then there'd be angels well i mean we said it didn't we like his it feels very much that what blatty is saying is that science doesn't have all the answers but the catholic faith does hmm. so then um blatty picks up with his with his own sequel um legion and say so it was a novel published in 83 apparently originally it was um he and uh friedkin kind of discussed the idea of doing a sequel and obviously Warner Brothers were really 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 keen to do a sequel mm. Blatty and Freakin had talked about it and they kind of had dinner together uh, Freakin wasn't really interested in Blatty's idea at all but they had been offered a lunch by an executive at Warner's who said look come to us with any idea you want write it up 8-12 to page treatment 
pitch it to me, even if we don't like it, even if you're not happy, we'll pay you half a million dollars. All right. So um, Blassie yeah. and Friedkin sat down and discussed it. Friedkin wasn't interested in the story, but they both said, we can't miss a half a million dollar lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went along and Blassie just sat back whilst uh -huh. Friedkin was pitching his own ideas, which were about you know opening on scenes of mutilated cattle and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Nothing came of the lunch, but they got paid. Blatty says he gave his money back. Well, he should have given it to the church, right? <laughs> uh, I'm interested to know what he did give to the church from his 39% profit share in The Exorcist. Wow, is that what he had? Yeah, he had a really good deal. Because wow. he was the producer. He shepherded the whole oh, thing right, through. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so he wrote it as Legion, the novel. Uh, the, the basic synopsis is it's set... Well, the movie version is set 15 years after the events of The Exorcist. Uh, Lieutenant Kinderman, who was the character who was investigating the death of Burke Dennings in the first novel, and Father Dyer were both close friends of Damien Carris, the priest who died. This is a little bit of revisionism because in neither the original yeah, yeah, book, exactly. in the film, they just meet well, once. Yeah, that's it. It's, yeah, yeah. And in the third film, he's talking about he's my best friend. Yeah, they've, they've like, known each other for years and were, were you know, you know, soulmates, best yeah, friends. Yeah, I mean, in the theatrical cut, it, it opens with George C. Scott stroking a picture of <laughs> Damien's face in a photo and pining on the anniversary of his death. Yeah, so, you know, along with Kinderman suddenly having a full head of hair, you, you have to accept that apparently they were best friends, and that's a bit of revisionism. Father Dyer, who knew Damien well, and Kinderman, who apparently knew Damien very well, are both mourning him on his anniversary. But there is also the first of a series of murders which seem to follow the pattern of a thinly disguised Zodiac killer called the Gemini it's so killer. So bizarre, that. What a bizarre th choice strange thing to transpose yeah into the film and especially because you know it had already been done in like dirty harry and everybody knows the zodiac killer and you know it's... we should come back to this very shortly kinderman's investigation eventually leads him to the hospital in georgetown where he is introduced to a patient in the disturbed ward. in the disturbed ward who looks exactly like damien Carris but seems to be um, hosting the spirit of the Gemini killer, who is insisting that Kinderman make the recent killings uh, public as Gemini killings. Uh, I think that's kind of all you need yeah, to know. Yeah, that's it. That's in. all you need to know. And if after that, you, <laughs> you, you've actually made it sound better than it is. But yeah, I think hearing that out loud, it just sounds like so ropey. I mean, there's some good moments in it, but, you know, I, well, I think I should yeah. just flag this up straight away. I just... I I didn't I wasn't blown away by them to say the least. I mm. both um, when I say them I'm talking about both versions. I definitely think the theatrical cut is better. I do too. Yeah, the um, director's cut is. I mean, it's, I know, it's I'm, excruciating. I know there's a lot of window dressing that you would need to add to the director's cut. You, you know, the sound design's not there, the music's not there. It's just not. But it's just not as good. Yeah, isn't it? I don't think the execution's there. To be honest, no. it all feels very. A lot of it feels very first, second takey. Yeah. Um, with the exception of Brad Dourif, who you know should be credited with like an inc it's an incredible performance, mm. considering he's pretty much sat down for the the whole film. Yeah, you do just kind of get mesmerised by his kind of ramblings. Mm. But there's stuff in the book that translates so badly on film, like him doing impressions of anim <laughs> animal noises. Uh, the thing we need to remember as well is this is this is. A major thing is that most of the book, you're inside Kinderman's head. You're seeing, seeing and yeah. hearing everything, and hearing, you know, feeling his thoughts about it, which, which does not translate yeah, but to it's film. It's a book, you know. It's yeah. a, that's what books do. They, but that's what yeah. propels you through what is basically a really ramshackle story. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the ideas and the telling through the characters which makes the book so gripping. Yeah, the, yeah, the book holds together. The, the film doesn't. I yeah. think. I'm I'm much more keen on the film. I think a good Two thirds of it works really well for me. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, we should talk a little bit more about the two different versions because the it, again trouble production. It was shot with a, a a story that's effectively a stripped down version of Legion. That version basically has Brad Dourif cast as Damien Carris. Yeah, they sort of reverse engineer him into history, don't they? So yeah, f there's a deleted scene that's supposed to take place after Damien Carris has gone tumbling down the. St the Hitchcock stairs yeah. in the first film and it's an autopsy and it's Brad Dourif on the slab. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so it's, that's on YouTube. That yeah, it's like a... Yeah, it's on extra... the disc as well as, oh, right, as an okay. abandoned prologue. 
Yeah, so there's that, and then the scene in the restaurant where the, uh, Kinderman and... Is it supposed to be Father Dyer? It is Father Dyer. Are in the restaurant talking about Damien Karras, and they keep looking at the wall, mm. but we never see what they're looking <laughs> at. So, it's, But in the original cut, there is a photo of, of Brad, Brad Dourif, Dourif as... Yeah. But this is one of the things that... I mean, it's a good change. I, I, I can totally see like Morgan Creek executives saying, I mean, really, we've recast all the three main characters in yeah, this. Yeah, How yeah. are audiences going to know this is supposed to be Damien Karras when it's Brad Dourif? Mm. Apparently, Jason Miller wasn't available for the original shoot because he's a heavy drinker. Oh, yeah. This is you know, it's purely what I've seen from a making of documentary. Mm-hmm. Brad Dourif said, look, he, he was not capable of learning his lines. Oh, yeah, okay. But when they came to do the reshoots, they must have kind of, you know... Yeah, because am I right that they presented the... The blatty cut, and they were like, "There's no exorcism in here. You need to get an exorcism in that's, here." That's that's the big thing, and that's why there's an exorcism. But there's and didn't they uh, then put uh, Father Morning? Father Morning, yeah. Nicole Williamson. Yeah, that's it. So they sort of then reverse engineered him into the narrative. And... Yeah, but the other change they did was because you know, obviously, if we just said Brad Dourif was playing Damien Karras, they mm. kind of reshot a lot of the first scenes of Patient X with um, Jason Miller. So obviously this is the body of Damien Karras. Yeah, yeah. That's objectively, and the audience will have that hook suddenly, which they didn't. I, they but, would never have had in the yeah, original exactly, version. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I actually loved that when uh, I was watching the theatrical cut second. So I'd sat through all of the the first one, the Durif uh, version. Um, and then when Jason Miller was on screen, I really liked it. And then when they cut yeah. to Brad Dourif, I found that really affecting. Yeah. You know, it really felt like you'd stepped inside the consciousness yeah, it to, was, it was to a... be face-to-face with the occupying force. I thought that was fantastic. Let's talk about the Gemini killer. because Yeah, so so weird. What a weird thing to do. It's a weird thing to write in. and It's, it's, it's... a weird thing to have, like, 15 years later. Because I was like, oh, what did I miss? Was there a Gemini killer in something else uh, uh, some other because they talk about them with such reverence these murders and everybody knew about them and that he was dead they just come out of nowhere watching this I mean this is like probably the like tenth time I've watched the movie this week it's the first time I've thought really don't need this Gemini character at all Mm. you could still have the same scenes yeah there's no point to the Gemini killer possessing Father Karras's body no because that could have easily just been the demonic force, you know, Pazuzu, who's exactly. back it could, it in could the just, background yeah, this time. It could just be the demon. Now doing... known as the master. I mean, I know it would require a little bit of rewriting, but I, I just it's just an extra layer of complication. And yeah. especially when you have such clumsy exposition scenes mm. as, you know, George C. Scott explaining the backstory of the killer. Yeah, and everything. So you it's need like, all that history then to get... You need to have this exposition halfway through the film and it's so clumsy. Yeah, yeah, it's rubbish. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the history is supposed to be. Is it that at the exact moment that Damien Karras left this mortal coil, the the switch well, was even, thrown on even the Gemini killer and then they there was like a, a fuge, like a Lost Highway type thing where Pazuzu stepped in and moved... Because that's that's what Gemini says. That well, Pazuzu... this is the thing. This it's even it's even slightly contradictory within the film itself, mm-hmm. because it says that as uh, Karis was slipping out, the master was slipping me in. Yeah. Okay, so you think the body's you know Karis's spirit has left and the body's inhabited by yeah the demon and whatever so, else. I mean, first thing, why would you put another spirit into a body that has? They say the brain is liquid, and it takes twelve. Or fifteen years well, that's, for that's the brain the, to that's rebuild. That's the specific or? revenge plan because the demon wanted to use this saintly body, um, a to get back at everyone involved in the exorcism, and, and, and b just because of the, the seems fun pretty... and fun and games of possessing a priest. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty petty for a, a demon. You know, I think. Well, it's a of... it's a spiteful petty a demon. Spi- yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, it, a it doesn't. Internet demon sat there. It doesn't quite away. hold together because later on, okay, well, the 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 same demon says he's in here with us. He will. Karis, you know, yeah, yeah, he's watching. He's watching what we do with his body. But Karis is in there because mm. towards the end of the film, he, he manages to emerge and yeah, and, yeah. That's and, now, Bill. No, shoot me now. Kill me now. So let's um, talk about a few of the people involved because it does actually have some some extremely talented people. Oh yeah, involved sure. below the line on this. Um, You've got uh, cinematography by Jerry Fisher. Mm-hmm. 
it's always nice when his name crops up. He's a British DOP. He's not kind of up there with the, with the greatest, you know, he doesn't get interviewed very often, should we say, but you look at his filmography and you've got a lot of Sidney Lumet. He did The Offence, which oh, yeah, was okay. uh, the British Sidney Lumet movie yeah, with yeah. Sean Connery. That's on the, is, on the review list, isn't it? Yeah, it's been rediscovered in recent years, mainly because mm. it's visual qualities, um, strange atmosphere. He did uh, Running on Empty, which is a later Lumet. Ninth Configuration, Wise Blood. Oh, yeah, okay. Man in the Wilderness with Richard Harris. Throughout his career, like you're looking at the directors he's worked with, Mike Hodges, Sidney Lumet, Billy Wilder, John Houston, Joseph Losey, Gene Wilder, Richard Lester, Harold Pinter. That'll do, won't it? It's amazing. That'll do for a career. But I'm, I'm always happy to see his name pop up in the credits. You know, you're going to yeah, get yeah, something okay. quite interesting. I really, really like his photography in this movie. There must have been some discussion about how to how to do this visually and I think it seems to be you know I, I want to take the opposite route to the exorcist I don't want to be kind of gritty and um and, and grainy and kind of semi-documentary um so it has a crisp sort of cool color palette is that how you see the exorcist like semi-documentary I just found it sort of the original I found it quite glossy and artificial oh I don't find it glossy in, fake in any I way it fake all. really yeah it's very odd well, let's let's sort of agree to disagree on that, but say that comparing these two movies, mm. whereas The Exorcist I kind of felt a lot of it handheld, this is very, very much sort of steady cam and dolly, mm. cool camera movements and zooms, simple blocking yeah. and zooms, yeah. Part of the thing that impressed me so much about this when I when I first watched it is, is was the style of the movie. Oh, yeah. um, the kind of very short elliptical scenes and the little kind of tableau images cut together to establish to establish scenes and then to come out. And... When I was watching it, I, I know what you're saying about the quality of the, the lighting, but I just found it, like, the execution I found really dated. It just felt like an old-fashioned film, like an old person making a film. And I just had a quick look at the films that were kind of out in the same year, and, I mean, you know, none of these are sort of masterpieces, but they're definitely pushing the, the genre, the horror genre. You know, you have Nightbreed... <laughs> Which, uh, you know, it is hard work, but it's trying to do something new. But is it trying to do something content-wise or formally? Because it's always looks yeah. to me like a bit of a, like a, a it's dog's a, breakfast. It's with a bit of a student, more of student frame. film, yeah. It's, yeah. It, you know, it's very much like cool pictures that don't flow. You know, the montage struggles. Mm. But then also you had Flatliners. That was shit. I, I mean, liked that was just Flatliners. A nothing. I thought that was, re- that was a really nicely executed movie. You really, as a teenager, you just sink into that, you know, and... You question mortality. I watched it as a teenager and questioned why I watched it. <laughs> questioned questioned <laughs> the uh, theatre owner. Hardware is the same year, and also Jacob's Ladder. They, they all feel, even when you watch them now, they feel quite fresh. Here's the thing. I, I, I see what you're saying, but I was thinking the same thing, but from, from the opposite side this morning. Um, I, I was seeing a lot of horror films around that time. Mm. I was seeing like late 80s, 1990 horror films. And they all felt fairly shoddy as if they were made more for video than for home mm-hmm. than for cinema. Yeah, right. And I felt this was a, con- a conscious decision to make something that didn't look like that. I mean, you're right. It is. Yeah. It's definitely an old man's film. One of the things I enjoyed about it watching it this time is like, oh, my God, there is no character in this movie who is under 45 years old. Yeah, right. I mean, obviously, there's, there's Atkins. Yeah, um, Atkins. But but that's it. Yeah, it's no, that's, a, it's that's a, a film point. by and for old people. And I think... Yeah, yeah, it's middle-aged, isn't it? It's a middle-aged movie. <laughs> but but I like that, you know, when That's I was 19. Really put that on the poster. And there's, you know, there's there's more in the pedigree as well. The editors, um, there's two editors credited. There's Peter Lee Thompson, who has a fairly unremarkable CV, except he did work. He was one of four editors that worked on Blatty's The Ninth Configuration. Oh, yeah. But the other editor is Todd Ramsey, who was uh, John Carpenter's editor for oh, Escape okay. from New York. The Thing... All right, Star cool. Trek the motion picture classic but I, I think his cutting on this is quite brilliant in places but I think he's trying to make the best of uh, a shoddy technique because I think Blatt is all over the place and uh, you know one of the things that has made me really nervous is I've often said that the ninth configuration is one of my favourite films yeah. but I haven't seen it in about 20 years and now I'm scared to go back I, I it's not one of my favourite films I think it's I think that one is a mess, and the fact that there's never been, like, I mean, there is what's supposedly a definitive cut, but mm. it's been hacked around so much, even up to the last minute for this cut. Yeah, right, right. That, I, I don't know, I think that one genuinely is a mess. I think this one is it's two-thirds of the way towards greatness. I really do. I think there's a definite filmmaking style at work here, 
which is in control of the camera and in control of the editing and not just shooting stuff and putting it together. There's de he's definitely approaching scenes with an idea of what he wants to do with them. Well, I think there's a lot of it that translates in terms of pictures from the book. Um, so he'll describe, you know, the blood running through the uh, between the pews in the church, for example. So it feels like he's kind of storyboarding in words. He has mapped it out in the book and mapped out some of the, the visuals and you do get that like you talked about the dream sequence you know mm. there's i think that stuff is there but i find the flow of images a little jarring you know an obvious one for me was when kinderman and Dyer go to the cinema mm. and they walk in and they walk through the foyer and he goes official police business and goes through and Dyer's following him and then he's talking to him and then he stops to turn around and he's gone to the uh, popcorn counter yeah. yeah yeah i just found all of that like completely disorientating and i don't i don't feel that at all i, f I find a lot of the the editing choices and a lot of kind of well the construction of the scenes and the way they're shot and put together is 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 very interesting and very kind of fresh mm. i mean this this can start us talking about the actual movie Finally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Start going through it. Which version? Theatrical. Theatrical. It's just all yeah. theatrical and the reconstructed, not quite original version. Because I have a feeling they didn't have all the takes and didn't yeah, yeah. cut that quite as well as it could have been. Is just a, a Blu-ray extra. It's the theatrical. I think oh, we okay. should talk about. So you get these kind of short, very short, clipped introductions to Georgetown, the house on Prospect Street, the steps, Father Dyer, Kinderman. Then you get kind of a very odd credit sequence which for a long time I took it as something actually happening in the movie as literal events but you watch it closely and you can see there's um, things in there which prefigure what's happening later in the film so it is just a fantasy credit sequence um, and then it becomes it could literally be interpreted as the dream that you hear being told I have a dream of a rose, a rose falling down downstairs, yeah. stairs. I mean what do they symbolize I just didn't find any they just symbolize the eruption of evil into the into the world you know, with the the doors bursting open and and this force coming to the church and causing disorder, it's not it's not happening on a literal level anywhere. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you have a kind of slightly obvious um, cross cutting between the sacred and the profane. You have uh, Father Dyer taking mass, and it it does introduce the way that people talk in this film. It's toned down a lot from the novel, but they have this kind of disconnected, slightly jokey arch banter, which sometimes tips over into into ill temper. Yeah, and you do it quite a lot in this film. Yeah, I think that he's trying to present Kinderman as you know this sort of cantankerous old old man, isn't he? You know, mm. quite spirited and uh, you know disarming. I I love Kinderman the character in this, and I think George C. Scott is is literally amazing in the role. <laughs> but you get a scene with with Dyer and Tim talking after the mass, where they're mm. talking in, in exactly the same way. This is basically blatty dialogue. Like I feel like Blatty's blagging it in his writing. I feel like he's just... It's the first draft of banter that he hasn't revised or... I don't I don't think it's that. I think, if anything, Blatty refines his dialogue and refines it to the point where it just seems almost abstract. I'd, I'd go with it if you'd said it was kind of theatrical because it kind of is. It's not naturalistic dialogue and it's not mm. supposed to be. But I mean, that's that's what it is throughout the film and throughout yeah, the yeah, book. Definitely. It's, yeah. yeah, it's definitely that, yeah. You know, it just doesn't... It, it, it's it's neither authentic or theatrical enough to be interesting. It's just kind of... It, it's fallen, fallen in the middle somewhere for me. The conversation in the restaurant is quite an important scene. It, they are talking about... Yeah, it's the anniversary of the... Yeah, and they're talking about, you know, kin Kinderman's thinking quite seriously about, you know... What is there a god in this universe? If so, mm. why why invent all these horrors in the world? And and Dyer is trying to console him, say we're spirits, we live forever. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll all come clear at the end of time. And again, that's one of my greatest favorite throwaway lines of all time. In there, you said Dyer system. You you wouldn't want to live forever. You'd get bored. Kim says, I have hobbies. Yeah, I have hobbies. Yeah, <laughs> that was quite a nice response. Yeah, but you you get this is this is the scene that explains. Dyer and Kinderman as characters. Um, you know, K Kinderman is, is tired, vulnerable. I off, I just worry for his health throughout the entire film because he's got yeah. a faint sheen of sweat and he is old and mm. working too hard, working too late. But at the same time, he kind of he hides his darker and deeper thoughts behind this kind of offbeat oh, look, humor. Man, you're, you're carrying a lot of that over from the book, I think. You know, I think. I, I think, don't think so. I think yeah. the book has informed your 
appreciation of no i don't I, I don't remember a great deal of the book I had, to, I had to go and refresh myself about it you know I, it's it's because in in the book he comes across as you know a, a wise soul-searching granddad old granddad type character you know mm. in, in the film i think i think it's it's too too brief an appearance i don't know to get I, that I, at this I, point. I, I think they're different characters in film and book. I don't, I don't, I don't see the same character in the film because it's impossible to do that. Mm. You know, you live inside Kinderman's head and you get to know him, but you only get kind of like the shell of it with George C. Scott. But mm. it, it's it's enough. I, I see George C. Scott's performance rather than just a carryover from from the book. Mm. But yeah, I just uh, I'm uh, unconvinced that when I'm watching them all kind of doing the work, I don't buy. I don't buy. Mm. Any of them, even George C. Scott, he has moments where I really like him. Mm. Um, there's a scene where later on, where Dyer's in hospital and he comes running around the corner because he's really keen to see his friend, and then he slows himself down and like mm. comes in at a walking pace and just sort of. And I thought that was a lovely detail, but a lot of the time, like, especially oh my god, that stuff with his family, I just I don't it feels like they're not even filming it together you know like he's just filmed it in an empty room and they've just cut it together together or something how strange it's yeah. just very very fleeting scenes where he's at home with yeah. his family and there's i feel a genuine warmth there no i just feel like it's like really made up like it's people pretending <laughs> to be a family <laughs> that's what it, definitely what it feels like there's a lot of pretending I, I find the confessional murder still really, really effective, just in a in your face with the music and sound design. I, I do like the way that it manages to scare you with just a darkened shot of the confession booth yeah. and the voice changing. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that, actually. And the, the priest is sat there listening and the old lady's voice as she's confessing like mm. a string Getting of murders. Yeah, that was kind of... And you could see the priest being like, what the fuck is this? Mm. Like, you know, he's really unnerved by that experience mm. possible that's a possible sequence oh, I, see. <laughs> <laughs> I did like you know the the blood seeping yeah and the absolute shock effect music as well it's just kind mm. of like a blast of of chaotic music over mm. there so this is obscene yeah and i guess a clever cut where you hear the scream which sounds like it's too quick to be uh straight after the murder and then you see the old lady walking out and somebody else screaming and mm. you know there's a, yeah that's a, a deftly handled i guess guess the technique works there just just about gets away with it praise to the editor mm. so the next major scene i think is kinderman's dream kinderman's dream so it's it's such a strange scene and it's so earnest as well it's it's you know this is a real cards on the table this is what i think happens you have so many things packed into this short scene which are, mm. which are basically his theology for the whole film and for the book you, know, you have that scene of the old woman trying to communicate and yeah yeah and, yeah know, that's it. the living are, the living are deaf to us and that sort of thing mm. and then you have you know real people from the story who are who are in limbo and it kind of the the dream starts to get darker as you realize that it's not just a dream it has some mm. bearing on the story and it, it's woven into it it also has Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson with his voice dubbed yeah. by someone else. And one of the Chippendales. Is it Fabio? Fabio, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but apparently yeah, I know yeah. his face in it, but I don't mm. know. And I do think that the switch at the end, you know, where you, the, the penny drops and you realise something terrible is about to happen. Mm -hmm. Kinderman sees Diane and says, yeah, I, I wonder if we're both dreaming this. It's no, Bella, I'm not dreaming. Yeah, yeah. I th that's just dazzlingly good. Yeah, he's me. just arrived, basically, hasn't yeah. he? He's fresh off the uh, the boat, the limbo boat, yeah. waiting, for, waiting to be processed. So that's happened while he's asleep. While he's asleep, mm. it's it's something terrible has happened in real life. Whilst mm. this dream's going on, and then this this middle section of the film is for me what what makes it outstanding. I know it tails off in places, but so I'm I'm about to go into raptures about the whole scene where Kinderman is taken to see Dyer's body. I just think the pacing of that, and when you know when you talk about what was going on in horror films at the time, mm. and the confidence to play it so quietly, I think everything pretty much comes together perfectly in that scene. The sort of quiet, deferential respect that his colleagues pay him. You know, cause you yeah, there's that lovely opening, opening sequence here through as he walks into the hospital and yeah. into the room. And everyone, kind of, you realise, kind of, everyone realises the gravity of the situation mm. and what it means to him personally. And there's just kind of this respectful nod. Mm. 
I'm, I'm going to stay well out of your way yeah, and yeah. allow you to deal with this. And I think Scott's performance in this of just just about holding back mm. the pain, I think, is is astonishing to me. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. But there's there's little little touches as well, you know, where he's examining the body, and then you take time to just kind of look around a few details in the room, and then it starts raining. Mm. Outside, you get the rain against the window to, yeah, to yeah. color the mood. It's a shame at the very end when you do the reveal of the writing on the wall, you have to get one of those <laughs> noises on it because it kind of breaks mm. the mood for me. But I just think it's it's the, the center point of the film for me. That did you enjoy it? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't not enjoy it. I do think he's really good in it, and I like the sort of cold horror of it. You know, the, mm. when they're trying to work out how does somebody drain all of this blood and keep it clean. You know, why why even do that? It's mm. such a, an elaborate thing to do to a body post murder or even during when he's still alive maybe I, yeah i'm not sure what the sequence is. he's supposed to be still alive yeah yeah so yeah yeah I, I take the cold chill of that one then and then we have one of my other favorite scenes um certainly in terms of acting where dr friedman the hospital administrator is kicking off and shouting and screaming yeah, it's, about it's a fun scene he's, yeah he's really but he the, was like t- talking about treating it like a war zone isn't he yeah um, and the tension mounts and mounts throughout the scene and then you get a fabulous they're all in a small office with a window out into the main corridor and you can just see Kinderman looking out and the reflection in the window is, is Dyer's body being wheeled out oh yeah you realise you know, this is the day that Kinderman's best friend has been killed yeah yeah for me a, astonishing bit of acting where Kinderman just said will you shut your mouth and you realise Okay, that rage is really cathartic, and you're mm-hmm. watching. And think, oh, yeah, you shut him up, and then you realise how torn up he is, mm-hmm. and uh, it just destroys me every time I see oh, that wow. scene. I, I just, and it's unfortunate that the scene then goes into a massive bit of exposition about right. what the Gemini yeah, kill was, because yeah. we've only, you know, we've been talking about it. We know the book, and we know the movie, but as watching the movie fresh, you've had these hints of something. And yeah, I mean, you've got three deaths at this point. You don't, really don't know what's going on, and yeah. you know, this is the point where you try and get some clarity and. And it comes in the form of a lengthy exposition <laughs> scene about murders that happened 15 years ago, yeah. and it's, it's a little and bit... And don't feature in any other movie, or, you know, this, this is your point of discovery for all of this information. Yeah. He's talking about the Gemini killer and his uh, modus operandi, and how it's always uh, the letter K in the name. There's so much crammed in, and there's, there's stuff that's but, retained you know, from the novel that doesn't even need to be there. The thing about about having to wanting to shame his father who was yeah, a preacher. Yeah. So well in the novel that's a key factor because it's the death of the preacher that ends the story. Yeah, exactly. It's got no bearing on the film yeah, whatsoever, it's, it's but it's still crammed yeah. in. Yeah, and then you get the thing of like, you know, is it Dyer? They're like, how is Dyer connected to that? And they're like, his middle name was, was Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh, oh my God. Yeah. It, was it? Next up is a scene which I, I I suffer through it. I think if I ever watch the film again, which I undoubtedly will, I'm just going to skip this scene. Mm. Kinderman goes to see Father Healy, who's the head of the diocese. Case. Isn't it? Diocese goes to talk to him about the case. The actual opening of this scene is fine. You know, the exchanging the information, that you know, talking about the case. But then, for some reason, and in both cuts, it does this. It goes into this long, meandering, spooky, haunted house. Mm. Where everything that's spooky about it is is something we've seen before. Yeah, yeah. Or something that's completely... Except there's a statue of the Joker. I don't understand that at all. No, that's that's bonkers. <laughs> and then, so yeah, so basically he gets creeped out, doesn't he? And there's a noise in the background, so he yeah. just leaves... Well, he, they, they replay the, the clock stopping, yeah. which suggested, you know, in the first movie, suggested a presence in the room. Mm. And then the conversation takes a lull and they look around. Yeah, and then Kinderman just goes to investigate and... Yeah, there's, there's bits of paper lift off the and yeah. doors close slightly by themselves <laughs> and you see you know, a, a, a whispered voice going, mm. it's, I don't know, something like, priest mm. like, what, what, time's, s- what time's the next bus? <laughs> and Kinderman wanders out and the lights are flickering and you know, all right, well, we understand, we've seen the movie, there's mm. a demon, you know, but it just leads nowhere. Well, it leads to a girl come running up to him bump into him and say, oh, sorry, I'm just on my way out. And it takes so long to get there. He's standing there with lights flickering and and just in, you know, admittedly it's a fairly spooky old church building, but it's Mm -hmm. not spooky. I just thought as well, she seems in remarkably good spirits considering two priests have been murdered and she works at the diocese. Um, And then, you know, that 
that's the jump scare that we've been waiting for. You know, your false mm. jump scare. Somebody jumps into frame, runs down the stairs. And then, but then Kinderman wanders back to sit down with Healy again and they mm. continue the conversation. And I'm desperately scissors in my hands wanting to cut out that whole middle section and just trim down the scene with Mm-mm. Kinderman and Healy. It really, really sinks that section of the film for me. Yeah, yeah. And around here we've been introduced in the theatrical cut, we've been introduced to Father Morning who... Uh, he, he exorcised a demon, that's all we know. Oh, okay. And it turned his hair white. It turned his hair white overnight. So that he bore a slight resemblance to Max von Sydow. <laughs> so you've got Nicole Williamson kind of wasted here as, as Father Morning. Yeah, it's it's a weird... It's a weird bit of casting. Yeah, and um, it, they, they talk about him uh, as, uh, you know, part of a reshoot and then we kind of go and sit with him in his chambers mm. while the window opens and shuts. And and this leads us into one of the kind of big meat and potato scenes of the movie, which is the first conversation between Kinderman and Patient X. Yeah. Go for it. I do like these kind of actorly scenes. I think George C. Scott is good in this, you know, as he's trying to process all of this information and make sense of it and grasp concepts that are maybe outside of his his faith and mm. but it's just a pleasure to watch Brad Dourif work in these scenes you mm. know and uh Jason Miller I think he's really good mm. for somebody who is written off for being incapable I think his performance is absolutely incredible yeah it's, yeah, it's really good yeah it's, yeah. it's definitely possessed mm. it's funny uh, Everyone I've spoken to about this, you would immediately sort of have the knee-jerk reaction. You'd think that a lot of people might find these scenes boring, but I've never met anyone who's complained about them, who's no. seen the film. No, I, I think that they're one of the pleasures of this film is, mm. is to just, you know, it's not even George C. Scott, to be honest. It's just watching Brad Dourif do, it, do his uh, mm. do his Dourif. And, the, you know, the, the actual kind of set and lighting is, is absolutely theatrically basic. Mm. It's a darkened room with two kind of unlikely mm. shafts of light from a window <laughs> yeah, illuminating yeah. the characters perfectly. So that's stripped down. There is a, quite a lot of nice background stuff going on just to keep you on edge. It's, it's not in the original cut because I don't think the sound was finished for that. But in the theatrical cut, there's some very careful pitch shifting of Brad oh, Dura's okay. voice. It kind of goes down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down, down, down. And then suddenly cuts to him in a higher register. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of, kind of, quite hypnotic effect. Mm. It's very, very carefully done. Yeah, I like those moments where he just sort of drops it down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's definitely in control of that, isn't he? I could have done without the animal impressions. Yeah. I, I like the comic effect of it. I like the fact that that the demon character is showing off and being theatrical and knows it. You know, he kind of refers to, I do that quite well, don't you think? Mm. The master it, taught me. Yeah. I'll tell you what's interesting. In The Exorcist, Father Merrin says to Father Karras, don't talk to the demon, don't get mm. engaged in conversation. It will mix lies and the truth to confuse you. Mm. This demon speaks the absolute truth all the way through. Yeah, right. It does not lie. Everything it says is mm. is a... Is fact, mm. which I thought was quite odd, Mm-mm. laying out for the audience and for Kinderman exactly what's been going on. There, it's weird. There, there isn't any mystery. It's this is what's been happening, and I know it's difficult for Kinderman to grasp. Well, that's it. That's where where the challenge is supposed to be: is a, a man whose faith doesn't allow for this to be true. Yeah, or well, whose whose rational approach to yeah to the world, and he has to find a way to accept this truth. Mm. That's what it's you know. But now we get to move on to the most, perhaps the most famous scene in the film. Yeah, and thank God I hadn't like done any research on, uh, you know, the, the frights or something <laughs> because this one, it, I was annoyed at first because it's quite a long scene, and then there's the fake scare where she goes into the room and the doctor is like, "Why the hell are you keep waking me up? I'm on a bloody shift," and you keep seeing characters coming in and out, the cops in the background, you know, and then there's that beautiful moment where it's almost completely clear on the ward. She checks a door, closes it, steps away from the door, and as she walks away, this figure just comes bolting out from the side in a long flowing white with, with gown. With a sheet over. Yeah, yeah, and these giant kind of... Uh, shears. Surgical yeah, the shears. surgical shears um, that we'd seen previously in an yeah. autopsy sequence. Crash, zoom in, and then a cut out. Yeah, and then like the, you know, the noise in the, in the sound is great too. I mean big problem for me with the scene is if it, the killer chops off her head there why is the autopsy in the or the investigation why does that take place in the hospital room off the main corridor 
when, mm. when it should be blood sprayed all over, <laughs> arterial blood sprayed all over the uh, reception desk. Details, details. Details, yeah. details. But it, it's a good scare, you know. It definitely got me like, in, you know, and by this point I was pretty much out of the movie, so to still get me like, whoa, mama. Yeah, that worked like like crazy in the mm. cinema. Yeah, obviously. I can imagine, yeah. When you watch it again, if you watch it a second time, can see how well choreographed all the events mm-hmm. are yeah yeah totally and when you watch it again you think, no you see like one of the cop comes in and mm. takes over and goes off and then the other one goes off he's like called away to do something yeah yeah and you're like, no no don't go don't go um it's it's really nicely choreographed yeah, it's for maximum clever. effect and so i was obviously uh referring back to the book while i was watching that sequence because there's a question later on that kinderman has in the book and at any point was access to this door left unguarded so when you see characters moving in and out i'm like oh is this the point when there's nobody so i was thinking about that as this figure comes (laughs) out from yeah and it was a a a big shock um old school shock definitely (laughs) it's really nice to see as well because you think obviously when you're watching a movie you see something and just is what it is and you think right well that's what they intended Mm. on the on the blu-ray there's lots of um deleted footage and outtakes and stuff mm. and they actually covered this really heavily oh okay there's loads of different angles of the figure you know from below close up mm-hmm. and tracking shots and all sorts and it was clearly like um an editorial decision just to play most yeah, of it yeah, out yeah. in the master because that that's it well i think the editor deserves a lot of credit on this yeah. i think so too so we have a couple of short scenes i mean as you described it in your notes it's a dead nurse and a dead doctor yeah pretty um, much and then we have the second conversation which is the next big scene yeah, there's a couple of nice moments in this sequence. I really like um, Gemini saying, you know, not to credit him for the death of Dr. Temple. That guy mm. just killed himself after the master had yeah. manipulated him he into... A, he was a weakly. Yeah, bringing bring Kinderman to the hospital. The theme of the second conversation is is uh, how, how the Gemini got into Karis's body. I think um, that's the story that's being told. Oh, it takes so long to tell this story, doesn't it? Mm. My main memory of this, of the conversations, is kind of shot front on. But there's a right. really nice shot which takes up the second half of this conversation, which is more of a three quarter. And Duriff looks so demonic mm-hmm. and so calculating and evil from that angle. Yeah, yeah. It really, really stood out to me this time around. Um, and then it starts to get a bit third acty, where things have to start to escalate. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the Kinderman's old... still questioning him, isn't he? He's like, How do I believe that you're the Gemini killer? And he's like, Well, yeah. I guess I'll have to show you, Bill. You know, I'll have to bring you to the dance. You know, yeah, and Kinderman is still not put the pieces together in the same way that the audience has. Um, he's wandering around. You're talking about the proxies and. Yeah, he's wandering around. You know, the Gemini's told him old friends help him, old friends, and that's mm. starting to sink in. He goes to see the the, the catatonics and the dementia patients in the mm. ward and you do get that extremely creepy shot of this is clearly on the ceiling yeah that's really nice i mean it's it's really well done that that little sequence even mm. when she sort of she looks over her shoulder at him i mean again you talk about the logic it's like where, where where's she going <laughs> like what's well, happening what's the point of that because well I think... what we see is a door opening and somebody looking out at bill and then the door closes mm. but she comes from a completely different direction you know whoever's busy in there because we later find out that a nurse has been knocked unconscious or killed uniform her uniform song yeah. but it's not this old bird that's up on the ceiling so yeah. what's happened it there? makes no logical sense no. I, I personally think it was kind of written in to be um the equivalent of the spider walk from the exorcist yeah okay um, I think it works a lot better. It's it's another of those shots that everyone remembers. From yeah, yeah. Itself. I mean, it's a fantastic sequence. Yeah, yeah. and it's really nice. For 1990, it's a really well done effect. Mm. It's still, you know, you can't see the compositing or anything. It's, it's a yeah, no, seamless it's super. Shot. I wonder how optical it is because mm. it's totally convincing. Kinderman realizes that there is a threat to his family. But he also has a K in his name, which is the modus operandi of. Yeah. Uh, and Gemini. he realises that the invitation to a dance is talking about his daughter Julie, who's mm. a dancer. So there's a, a breakneck drive yeah. through Georgetown. It's A to B in the fastest possible yeah. way. They really hammer through the streets, don't they? And they're cross-cutting um, with quite a clever bit of sort of Terminator voice misdirection. The, the um, nurse has called up using Kinderman's voice. Oh, yeah. Saying that a nurse will be arriving with a package, uh, whereas Kinderman's on... You cut to Kinderman on the phone trying to get through, getting the busy turn. Yeah, realise yeah, yeah. that. So he um, drives across there in a panic, and he gets in, and um, 
I, I, I think the sequence, as a sequence, works really well. I think it's an improvement on the novel, because in the novel all this happens, and then Kinderman arrives there. And it's this, a real anticlimax, isn't it? It really doesn't end a narrative at all in the, in the novel. It's yeah. just kind of like you've got this ghost in the machine thing of the father being somewhere, and you get a couple of... You do brief... see the father in the book. He's, well, that's the thing. He's working in a soup kitchen, isn't he? And he's, he's... The idea is that he's uh, an evangelist that was actually uh, like a really nasty bastard at home yeah. and treated his children terribly and, you know... But he's reformed, and he is actually working in a soup kitchen. And he's thinking and about preaching again. Yeah. But the Gemini killer's agenda was always to continually shame his father because of the neglect that the children that had that led to the death of his of his brother of his brother. So, but this but it's clumsily written into the novel. The Gemini's father is used as the means to finish the story. Yeah. In the book, which is incredibly poor. Mm. Um, for things just anticlimax, for the Gemini's father to have a heart attack at the very moment off when, screen, as off well, screen, yeah. when Kinderman's family are in danger, and for that to finish the story mm. is appallingly bad. And I think Blatty realised that and tried to make things more exciting. And it's an exciting scene. I like it. Yeah, it's kind of unexpected. And the nice thing, having read the book, I was like, oh. So that, this is it then. This is that dead end scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I still find it very, very tense and exciting. I still really like, even though it's an odd way of filming it, the, the shot of the head being dragged out of the path of the shears. Yeah, what is it? Like stop motion or something? It, I think it's overcranked. Uh, oh. No, or undercranked. So that... So that, and then they're doing everything in slow motion mm -hmm. so that it appears faster but has that kind of weird unreal judderiness. Yeah. It's a very strange way to do it, but it's really effective for the moment. And I do think that the demonic roar of the nurse as she kind of falls to the floor is, is quite terrifying. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, she's on yeah. a board or something. Yeah. She's just been layered back. But also you get that brilliant line where he's, he does say, oh, you've, you've worked it all out, you know, catatonics mm. are easy to possess. Yeah. yeah, I thought that that's a really nice moment. Mm. <laughs> but why is every... Gemini able to possess other people? It's not made explicit, but when the Gemini says that the master slipped me in... I oh, get the I feeling that it's the demon moving him around from body to body, okay. providing him with that power. The puppet master. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, now is the time to discuss that very concept in the film. In 1983, I think the idea of a serial killer moving from body to body to kill people was fairly fresh. But by 1990, and certainly throughout the 90s, it was an idea that came up again and again yeah, and right, again. Right. Like in 88, you've got The Hidden... Yeah, yeah. 89 you've got Twin Peaks oh I love The Hidden that's such a good movie <laughs> it's a good B movie yeah yeah that's really good you've got the same concept in Twin Peaks with yeah. Bob moving from host to host yeah yeah um, you've got it in this movie I'm sure there was a couple of others in the 90s mm -hmm. there's definitely one that explicitly had the same concept what about have John Goodman in I think that one. Oh yeah that was um, oh my god with uh, Denzel Washington yeah Fallen I it's, forgot about yeah, that but the whole concept of, of of demonic possession mm. as as kind of like a means of serial killing yeah. or is I can't for me it originated in this novel it's definitely a thing now and it wasn't in 1983 at this point in the in every iteration of the story for me things go a bit off the rails i think the book finishes terribly anticlimactically but you do get the nice epilogue with Kinderman explaining his philosophy of life. Yeah, because, I mean, those questions, the philosophical questions, the theological discussions are the centrepieces of the book. And, you know, the plot is is bare bones. Yeah, it's you know. just it's a coat hanger, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it goes, it goes to a couple of places and, you know, investigates a few deaths and they're all connected you know it's like it's really basic mm. but the soul searching is is what's most interesting you know and i think if i hadn't kind of already made my mind up about blatty i probably would have enjoyed that stuff a bit more but mm. even then i still liked his this idea that the big bang the all the science behind that runs in parallel with the theological idea that lucifer falls from heaven mm. and explodes into a million pieces and which is the universe as we know it yeah and then our evolution is about piecing lucifer back together mm. to make him whole and only when that happens will we be able to evolve into and the idea that that the universe is is one 
being, if you like, mm. explains all those. Because throughout the book, it's, it's Kinderman comes up with scientific examples of things that should be impossible. Yeah, yeah. Like the autonomic system and, mm. and things things in evolution that, yeah, yeah. that we but, say just happen, but are just so freakish that you would assume there's a, a, a design behind it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the book provides you with that. The original cut of the film, I think, has way too bleak an ending, which I, I'm not surprised yeah, but also it's it's also anticlimactic, you know. After after all that fuss at his house, yeah, he just walks back into the ward and shoots. Well, I mean, it it makes sense, but dramatically it goes nowhere. Mm. And also, I you know, if he's, but he's, I like Kinderman, and I don't want him to throw away his family and his career and the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. shooting an unarmed man in the head in a hospital in a yeah. hospital a mental um, patient. Yeah. <laughs> It, that doesn't work for me. But so. what, it, what that does say is that Kinderman accepts that Karis's body is possessed That's, by Pazuzu and Gemini. And, yeah. You know, so he, he accepts a reality that he was previously sceptical about. But at what cost, though? It's too great a cost for me, for the character. Yeah, but, you know, then does it come back to the message of the film being stick to the teachings of the Catholic Church and respect the Catholic Church? Church's opinions I think it, on that? Is that it, what it's it go, saying? Well, I think you're beyond those teachings when, when you're talking about killing somebody. Oh, yeah, thou shalt not kill. That's yeah. pretty, pretty... Yeah. So, for me, you know, I can understand the studio's notes. Yeah, of course. And at this point, in the theatrical version, we have Father Morning coming into his own mm-hmm. and arriving. Um, Don't worry, lads, I've got this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this. Um, arriving to perform um, a sudden exorcism yeah, yeah it's like you're saying what does it say on the poster what does it sound it says exorcist exorcist it's me that's me not you it's a pretty gory scene but he's fairly ineffective as an exorcist as well i think he's completely outgunned at this stage mm. i think we should talk about the exorcism scene as as a chunk yeah yeah of course. um it's a pretty cool scene you know it's pretty spectacular <laughs> I, I don't mind it. I think it's good that Blatty bit the bullet and decided to do it himself because mm. he was able to tie it into some of the stranger elements of the rest of the film. It is theatrical mm. and it is odd. It's definitely not the exorcism. It's really over the top you yeah. know, and really big scene. It's not like you, you know, you'd you imagine a reshoot ordered by the studio to just be like, okay, just fucking tag something on the end there yeah, and make it three work. Pe- three priests yeah, standing yeah, uh, around him. You know, power of Christ compels you. Power of Christ yeah. compels you. Just say that. You know, it it really does go great guns to do something. Yeah, it's visually got crazy lighting, spectacular snakes and flames and flesh yeah, yeah. peeling and and a brilliant lightning. moment for George C. Scott when he's pinned up against the wall by Pazuzu, and he's screaming and shouting about what he believes in and how much he's accepting this these mad visions and hallucinations and the presence of evil in the world and demons and he does really well considering how much he hated the material. I read an mm. interview this morning with Brad Dourif oh, yeah, okay. talking about the two different versions. Very, very brief interview. Mm-hmm. And he said he and George C. Scott were watching them filming that stuff and George C. Scott said, you know, if Madonna doesn't come on and do a song, people uh-huh. are going to be very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is very much sort of like, like a prayer Catholicism, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Again, it's, cr- it's a crazy scene, but it works. Everyone kind of dismisses it instantly as is, you know, it's, oh, it's tacked on, it's ruined the film. It's like, mm. well, the film didn't work anyway yeah, yeah. at that point, so it can't be any worse, and mm. it isn't. I think it, it gives the film an ending. I mean, it's pretty standard practice in filmmaking. <laughs> if you look at something, you don't just say, okay, it's not good enough, but we have to stick with it. Yeah. You know, I think people generally go back and shoot, you know, yeah, more stuff. A- anything from a day or two to months and months and months. Mm. It's not at odds with the rest of the film. As I said, it does. It is shot in the same style as some of the stranger things mm. elsewhere in the film. It's pretty gory, though. Yeah, it's nasty. The scene where uh, Morning gets pinned, pinned to the ceiling, ceiling and then peels himself off and leaves half his skin behind. is mm. like, oh, God, that's, uh, that's a bit heavy. And it does build to... You know, I think I think the very moment at the end where Karis takes takes back control. Well, there's a little sort of three way, isn't there? With uh, morning picks up the crucifix. Point, God, God point. gives power the morning to yeah. pick up the crucifix. Yeah, and... that's it. And then uh, Karis steps forward from the blackness to regain control of his own body, as Kinderman drops to the floor with his gun mm. and starts starts blasting. And but... the, the the moment with. With Karis regaining control, say, Bill, shoot me now. It does mm. feel really tense and yeah, urgent. Yeah, yeah. It does mm. work. As odd a scene as it is, 
if you watch the two trailers for it. Yeah, I did there's actually. There's some fucking crazy stuff that they didn't put in the film. Yeah, actually. they're they're trying to like flash cut or flash cut to unused makeup yeah. prosthetics and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it? and like this um, fuge state between Karis and Gemini. Mm other souls pushing through from beyond you know it's yeah there's a lot of footage from that exorcism shoot which is in the trailer but not in the film mm. thankfully so where where does you know the exorcist i won't say trilogy series of films <laughs> the exorcist one and three sit in your kind of uh you know if you're looking at horror um, well, I mean, I would never, as much as I like, as much as I like it, I'd never make any massive claims for The Exorcist 3. It's, what's that phrase, a curate's egg. It's a, it's an, a very odd thing full of interesting stuff, but mm. not necessarily as a whole particularly saleable. Not something I would recommend to everyone. Yeah, sure. The Exorcist for me is still, I mean, it seems boring to say it. Um, Kerry, my wife, has this phrase, uh, non-song, which is what she uses to describe a song which is perfectly good, often very, very good, but um, has been so played to death oh, in other contexts, in adverts and on television, yeah, sure. that you stop hearing it as a song. Mm. I, I feel The Exorcist for most people is just like a non-song. It just is what it is, and it's so ever-present that it feels boring to be talking about it. But I do think it's... I, I really, really like it. For me, it's one of my top ten horror films. Oh, right, OK. I, I'm... Not just for the story, but for the technique, I think is is absolutely masterly mm -hmm. throughout. I don't know. For me, uh, having you know sat through this trilogy, um, you shouldn't have done it all in one hit. Yeah, maybe. But if I zero in on Exorcist Three, I'd have to say it's maybe a reference material for other filmmakers, but I I don't know if it. You wouldn't suggest it as an entertainment for anyone. No, not for anyone. <laughs> I, I mean, I I like it a lot, but I wouldn't recommend it either. And you made me watch it. Yeah, I know. And, and you made me read the book. So regret it as well. <laughs> no, I did uh, appreciate moments in there and some of the technique for sure. I mean, you say you've seen it ten times. What what, what keeps you going back to it? I just think it's it's interesting and elusive, um, and I I it's just one of those things that I like the way that it's made. Mm -hmm. It appeals to me, so I will go back and. You know, in the same way that you like a recipe and you'll cook it again. I'll, I'll go back and watch it repeatedly for that. You know, there's scenes that, that work really well for me and each time I watch them I'll be enjoying how they're made. I think I'm, I think I'm clear-sighted enough to not to say that because I like it it's important or it's mm -hmm. great. But I, I do like it a lot and that's why I've got, you know, I've seen it in the cinema and it on VHS, DVD and now two Blu-ray editions. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fairly solid just fan of it. <laughs> 